fourth episode in our series on broken glass. So this one will be dedicated to art history and uh, will be followed next week with uh, an, an episode on contemporary art practices with glass. So we're very much looking forward to this pair of talks. And with that in mind, I invited a next week speaker, uh, Ms. Maria Azoun, uh, who is a visual artist working between New York and Venice to uh, moderate for Kern's talk. And in return, Kern agreed to moderate for Maria next week. So I'm very much looking forward to the dynamics today and very much to have you all with us. Again, an eclectic audience uh, spanning pretty much all the fields, judging by the names who've been with us since the beginning, all the fields are presented in the meeting. So this is all very exciting. And now I will turn the floor to Maria so she can introduce our speaker. Thank you, Maria, for agreeing to moderate for us. Thank you, thank you for having me. So, um, Kuhn is an artist, professor, and author I met in Toronto back in 2015. His works can be found in many collections in North America and Europe. Since 2006, he has been a professor and the studio head of the glass department at Sheridan College, Oakville, Canada. And before that, from 1990 to 2010, he ran his own studio in Neil, Belgium. He is also the series consultant for Netflix's Blown Away, a series on glass blowing for which he helped build North America's biggest hot shop. He is the author of the book, Glass Virtual Real, which I consider being a treaty on glass and its history in art. The book is published by London-based Black Dog Publishing. I'm gonna show it to you, it's really wonderful. Here it is. It's like a really big book. So, and after, after working for more than 30 years with the glass medium, Kuhn witnessed the evolution of the mag this magical material in society. People's awareness of the medium was growing. He had noticed that glass literally bewildered the visitors he took regularly around the studio or when he was explaining to his students what glass actually is. The transformation of ordinary sand into a totally transparent medium and the act of blowing glass seemed to be like a magical phenomena to everyone, always. He thought that this is the same feeling of wonder people felt hundreds or thousands of years ago when they saw glass making. Change had taken place over the years and is still going on, especially in the art world. It made Kuhn gradually delve deeper in the intrinsic qualities of glass, exploring its artistic and philosophical values. He also wondered why it took until halfway through the 20th century for glass to make its way into fine arts. There was hardly any glass sculpture dating from before the 1950s. So his first quest was to find out if there was any. And in order to provide a better understanding to the situation in the 20th century, it was necessary to research the history of the previous periods. He noted that the perceived value of glass was related to the craftsmanship of its makers and to the complexity of the medium. Therefore, he focused on the aesthetics and functionality in craft and art and focused on its philosophy and science. I will let Kuhn share his journey with glass and art, provide us with fascinating insight knowledge views and interpretations of the works he explored throughout the centuries, starting from the Renaissance to our times. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, um, Yeah. first of all, thank you, Jihad and uh, Hiba for organizing all this. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to bring people together uh, from all different fields. So uh, I'm very happy with that. Um, so today, yes, indeed, I'm going to be talking about the history of stained glass, but it's not like a traditional overview, uh, detailed overview of the whole history of, of uh, stained glass. What I would like to try to do today is to um, show you some similarities and some differences between how glass was approached by glassmakers and by um, painters in the first place to see where there was a partnership and where there was a difference and to see how that um, had an effect on today's situation about stained glass um, in specific. So I prepared some uh, lectures for you. So I'm going to share my screen now so that you can see them as well. Uh, 
And I hope everybody can see this full screen. I don't hear anything, so I guess that's a yes. Yes, I um, see it full screen. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, as I said, like it's not a detailed overview, and it certainly doesn't um, relate to all aspects of stained glass. And I would like to start uh, by saying that um, this lecture is Eurocentric, but that's more because of the subject matter, not because uh, of any like um, absence of stained glass in other parts of the world. Um, so I want to start with some uh, images of Islamic glass, stained glass, to show you that um, in the Islamic world, stained glass like has like some very fantastic uh, examples as well. And I would like to acknowledge that within the whole history of glass, the Middle East has been very important. Um, the Middle East is where glass was invented in the first place, um, but also after the fall of the Roman Empire, where glass was a very important medium. Um, in the West, the tradition and the craftsmanship was lost, and so it was continued in the Middle East, and it's only during the Renaissance that that information came back to Western Europe via Ven uh, Venice. So that's why Venice is such an important center for glass in the world still today. Um, but all that would not have happened without the um, further development of the skills and the knowledge and the science of glass in the Middle East. So um, just to make that clear, I wanted to uh, start with that. So where does the history of, of glass and glass windows start? Well, as far as I know, it started uh, in the Roman period. So the Romans already had glass that they would use to protect themselves from the weather and at the same time still get light into the building. Um, it was mainly just like panes of glass uh, that would replace quite often paper that was used or um, uh, other thin slabs of, of translucent stones. But it really starts taking off in the Romanesque period uh, in, in, in Europe. And so here we see the oldest glass window, stained glass window in the world, but I have to say that this is not the original one. It's a little bit of uh, a cheat here because it was put together uh, 20 or 30 years ago um, and just basically randomly put together with scraps that they found, broken pieces that they found of old stained glass windows that must have been there around 675. So the pieces are original, but the stained glass window itself is not. For that, we have to um, wait a little bit longer. Here we see the cathedral in Augsburg in, in Germany, and that's probably where we find the oldest in situ uh, stained glass windows. And they date from late 11th, early 12th century. So that's where the story starts. And as we can see, um, back in the days, in Europe, the centers of culture and the centers of craft was basically the abbeys. That's where um, not only like stained glass, but any kind of like craft tradition started. Also like um, writing of books and all that, everything was centered in, in uh, a very religious Catholic dominated uh, Europe. And so um, although glass was forbidden to make chalices, um, it was not forbidden to make stained glass within the Catholic Church. And it was a very powerful way of transferring a message. Um, you, you have to know that during that time, um, the, the priest was basically um, speaking Latin. Now, most people couldn't read or write, so they couldn't get their information from books. They didn't understand Latin, so they couldn't get their information from there. So they were depending quite often on images and, and pictures to uh, see the stories. And so that's what we see in the stained glass windows that they would tell the story um, about um, the, the history of, of uh, the religion and uh, the stories in the Bible. And so um, stained glass was obviously a very powerful way of doing that. Like not only like do you see the images but also the, the sacral light almost that comes through the windows and that colors up the interior of the church must have been very powerful 
especially knowing that a lot of the Romanesque churches were rather small with rather small windows because of the cold temperatures in, in Europe and, and the harsh weather. Um, and so the little light that would come through through those stained glass windows and all those colors would have been uh, a very powerful way of um, bringing the message. We also know from um, a book on, which is called On Divers Arts, which was written by uh, a monk, Theophilus, a German monk. Um, he wrote in 1125 about uh, glass. And in his description, we find out that it was basically one person who was making the whole stained glass window. So um, the blowing of the glass, the cutting of the glass, the painting of the glass, the putting it together, pretty much all happened within one studio. Uh, and this is important. Um, it is important because like it was basically all done by one team of people that would see the process through from beginning to end, including the design and everything. Um, the development was mainly in France, uh, Germany, um, the Low Countries, England, so uh, that part of Europe. And quite often also those glass makers would travel around. So it was not unusual that um, those glass makers would travel from one place to the other. And there's indications that there are similarities between certain cathedrals that were done around the same time. And so um, it's, it's uh, um, known that for instance, uh, English um, um, uh, kings would, would invite French glass makers to make stained glass windows for them and probably vice versa as well. So after the Romanesque period where stained glass was one of the important um, art media, we see that in the Gothic period that even gets more important. Um, the Gothic period was a period that um, was basically where the whole architecture was built around like that idea of looking up to the skies, looking up to the heaven and looking up to God. And so we see that in the architecture with the very high small columns, we see that at the top of the windows where it's pointed towards the heavens and stained glass was a very important part of that. Here we see uh, the marvelous examples of uh, Saint-Chapelle in, in Paris. And so uh, again, like very impressive. Like if you ever have a chance and uh, visit this, this place in Paris, it's, it's just overwhelmingly magnificent, magnificently beautiful. And so we see that during uh, this period, glass, becomes really one of the most important mediums in architecture as well as in art in general. And um, uh, another thing that we notice is that towards the end of the 13th century, there's slowly a divide starting between blowing and um, the actual making of the glass windows. And then we get to the Renaissance. So the Renaissance around 1400s, 1500s, when it starts, it still um, uses a lot of stained glass. Stained glass is still a very important uh, aspect. And we see that also within the stained glass window, similar teams are be, being depicted as in, as in uh, the paintings. So here we see, for instance, an Annunciation, um, which is also something that regularly appeared in paintings. Um, we also see that a lot of like painters actually get involved in the making of stained glass windows. Um, so people that we know from maybe other disciplines in the arts um, also made glass windows, which is maybe less known in, in general. Here we see, for instance, an example of uh, Lorenzo de Giberti. And so, um, these are several examples of stained glass windows that he made in Florence. Now, we might know him better from this door, Door of Paradise, and um, the sculptures that he made. Another example uh, that we see is Donatello. Donatello also made um, glass windows for the, Dome, the Duomo in, in Florence. 
and we know him probably better from his sculptures. So what we see in the Renaissance is that like, and, and probably that's where the, the name Renaissance man comes from still. Renaissance man is kind of like the man that knows it all and does it all. So it was not uncommon during that time that um, man would be like not only making stained glass, but also would be painters, also would be sculptors, also would be inventors, would be um, engineers, architects, like they kind of like did it all. But what that has as a consequence for stained glass itself is that we see more and more a divide between the part that is the design part and the painting part and the part that is the um, actual making of the stained glass window. It's clear that by that time, the glass is no longer made in the same place where the stained glass windows are made. Glass gets blown into um, glass hot shops. And so um, they basically only do the blowing part, making the sheet glass, and then the stained glass windows shops would like buy the sheets and start working with them. Another divide that we see happening is that um, there is a divide between, on one hand, the design of the glass and the painting of the glass, and on the other hand, the putting together of the glass and, and, and the actual craft part and making part. And um, around that time, we see that uh, Sanino d'Andrea Sanini wrote a book about uh, Il Libro del Arte. So it was written in the 15th century. And in his chapter nine, <clears throat> he talks about um, glass. And uh, in there, you see that he basically only gives a description of the stained glass part where, where he talks about the painting of the glass and the designing of the glass. A little bit about the making itself of the glass, but he totally ignores the production of the, the sheet glass itself. Um, and he also um, glorifies basically the artists who are making the designs and doing the painting work and looks down a little bit on the craftspeople that are putting the windows together. So the glass people are, are basically reduced to craftsmen. And he even writes that without um, without the mastery of the painter, they wouldn't be able to make the stained glass themselves um, because they don't have the um, design skills. See. So another thing that happens during the Renaissance is the invention of perspective. And that's a very important thing. It will dominate basically um, the arts for the next like four or five centuries. And so with the invention of um, perspectivism, Alberti describes it, but he also argues that painting should move from the artist mechanica to the artist liberalis. What does that mean? That basically he wants art not to be regarded as a craft, but more as uh, something that would be equal to what philosophers are doing. Um, and so he says that art is a form of rhetoric. And in order to make his point, he has to prove a number of things, like basically five steps. Um, he has to prove that what an, a painter is doing, because it's, that's basically the art form that he's talking about. Um, he has to prove that what a painter is doing is exactly the same as what a philosopher is doing, like the classical like Greek philosophers and so on. And he says, like, they start with an idea. They start with the concept. So do painters. The second step is that um, you have to structure your subject matter that you're going to be talking about. And so in painting, that's basically the same. It's like making the composition. It's basically uh, making the design. Designio is still a word that we now use as design. Um, so that's, that's uh, um, what happens in, in uh, visual arts. Then there is the uh, elocutio, the eloquence of the speaker. So he says like with artists, it's the same, like they don't have the eloquence of the speaking, but they are using the colors in order to express themselves. And the colors give like um, basically um, like the way of like communicating in a, in a like very like colorful way. Um, 
then there was a little bit of a problem with memoria. So when, when a philosopher um, holds a speech, he has to memorize the speech. Like he has to know what he's gonna be talking about. Now with the painting, it's, it's a little bit um, more difficult to argue that, but here he basically said that like, it's the story in the painting that relates to the history that like makes that like um, visual arts and painting involves like memory as well. And then finally, there's the actual speech, like the, um, the orator, like performing uh, to the public. And he says, well, the painter does something similar by executing the painting and, and presenting it. And so he basically concludes that the painter is an orator who works with images instead of words. And so he brings that argument in a very successful way. And we see that like, um, paintings in a way also become more uh, mathematical and, and the composition becomes more important. Um, but while he is um, basically convincing that there is indeed something to be said that uh, painting should be part of the Artes Liberales, um, around the same time or shortly after, it also means that um, not only um, painting is liberated, but also thinking about painting. So we see that that's the first um, moments where we see uh, examples of art history, like Vasari wrote his book uh, about Michelangelo and other artists. Uh, it's also the moment where art theory starts and art critics starts and art philosophy starts. So a lot of things happening there. And although painters got elevated to the level of the artist liberalis, um, Glassmakers did not. Glassmakers remained in the realm of the artist mechanica, in other words, within the crafts. And so for the first time in the history of arts, um, we see that there's this like split, the divide that starts happening between on one hand, the fine arts, and on the other hand, the crafts. Before that time, the distinction was not really made and it was all more like blended. Um, and even during the Greek period, you could argue that the craftspeople were more respected than the artists. But so all that changes in, in the Renaissance. Although, as you can see with this example, um, the craftsman's sk uh, skill, but also like the, the actual depiction and, and the actual uh, image and, and the message that is brought uh, on this stained glass window is just as good as any other painting would be. Now, what is the importance of perspectivism? Um, the importance there is that it was like a, a, a really new thing for people, like a, a new visual experience. And for the first time, like people were confronted with images that looked as if you could like see in three dimensions, as, as if you could like almost like look into the wall there and see in an, a whole new space. And like, if we want to compare that with something that we would like um, experience nowadays, you could say that it's the similar thing as like when we put on like new 3D goggles, for instance, and we look around and we see like a whole new uh, virtual world appearing in front of our eyes. Um, that's a totally new experience for us. Um, just like 50 or 100 years ago, like people for the first time saw movies and it was a totally new visual experience for them. So this is something like very similar and powerful in nature. And so with the invention of that uh, perspectivism, we see that um, painting really rises to new, to new heights. On the other hand, as far as stained glass is concerned, so although during the Renaissance, stained glass is still like really one of the most important um, mediums in the arts, we see that after the Renaissance, and especially with the Reformation, um, stained glass really gets like a, a very serious dent. Um, during the Reformation, um, the Protestants basically um, um, condemned the early, the, the earthly excesses of the Catholic Church. So all like what, what kind of like um, showed any kind of richness and, and like everything that was related to excesses um, was, was condemned. and. Uh, that led to, at one point, the great iconoclasm. So it was a war where, um, um, under like 
influence of Martin Luther and, and John Calvin and people like that, where the Protestants would basically raid churches and would start destroying um, everything they could. Like they, they destroyed um, um, sculptures, they would destroy stained glass windows, they would destroy, destroy everything that looked <clears throat> too frivolous. Um, and so after the Reformation and with the Counter-Reformation, we're talking about like the mid 16th to uh, mid 17th century now, we see that paintings keep evolving. And like here we see like this fantastic example of Rubens um, in the Baroque style. And so it, it just like keeps building up and, and uh, paintings become like bigger and, and more impressive and, and Whereas on the other hand, stained glass windows kind of like start disappearing. Um, one of the reasons was of course, because many of them got destroyed, but also like even the ones that got replaced um, after, after like the whole uh, reformation, the Catholic church became a little bit more careful in, in, in what they were doing. And so they tried to avoid displaying excesses. And so they no longer made these like big commissions for stained glass windows. And a lot of the destroyed windows got replaced by windows that were a lot more simple, quite often with just simple geometric designs, um, less color uh, and so on. So we see that um, during the next centuries, glass more and more um, becomes like this, this kind of like thing that uh, found its way within the bourgeois, right? Like, people that had money um, or local uh, political important people or people that thought that they were important um, would, would commission stained glass windows because it was still like um, seen as like a um, form of wealth and a, and, and a display of like good taste and culture and all that. But in reality, we see that the stained glass windows, um, the quality is going more and more down and um, people start ordering even like the stained glass windows from catalogs where you basically have standardized windows um, quite often um, showing like beautiful sceneries or crafts or like images of a, a baker baking his bread and that kind of thing. Um, so where we see that between the Renaissance and let's say the 20th century, um, glass and stained glass window in, in, in particular is starting to uh, go down more and more. Um, we see that painters um, having their high days. Um, and the question is, of course, like, so did that also mean that painters no longer were interested in, in making stained glass or that they were no more, no longer interested in, in glass in general? Um, absolutely not. On the contrary, um, in my book, I argue that. Um, painters between the Renaissance and, and modernism, that painters did more research and spend more um, um, time on studying glass than the actual glass makers did. And the reason why I'm saying this is like, um, in the first place, because of this painting, this is one of the first examples, but also one of the um, clearest examples of, of what I mean with that. So this is a painting by Van Eyck. Um, Flemish painter, and um, in this in this painting, which is one of his like well-known paintings, also the image on the invitation is um, the Lamb Gods from from Van Eyck, like his his probably most um, important painting um, in Ghent. Um, here we see that like right smack in the middle, where the main focus of the painting is like about like two thirds up and right in the middle. Uh, we see this, this mirror. And so that's not a coincidence, right? Like it's almost even that as the couple is kind of like um, framing that mirror. So let's have a closer look at that mirror and see what's going on there. Aside from the fact that Van Eyck was like a, a, a perfect painter with like really a lot of detail, um, like it's incredible. Like even if you zoom in, like the details that are still recognizable, like he was known to be painting with um, brushes with only one hair uh, for the details. So we see that um, in this mirror, we look at the back of uh, the couple that is being um, painted. 
Um, but there's more going on. So what happens with that mirror is not only does it show the couple from the back, but it also opens up the pictorial plane. Um, when you go back to the original image, if we look at the window, we hardly see anything outside. If we look at the mirror and we look at the window, now all of a sudden we can see more of the space. We also see other elements of the space that we would not see directly looking at the painting. So the mirror clearly opens up the pictorial plane of the, of the painting. But also, as you can see, like this was not just a flat mirror, but a spherical mirror. And there is an optical distortion. And we see almost that like in the center, there's little or no distortion. But then the more you go to the outside of the um, uh, mirror, the more you get the distortion and kind of like that roundish effect as if everything is curving around that center. And so again, it's not a coincidence that between the couple, we see two people right smack in the middle of that uh, mirror, hardly um, any distortion. So who are those people? Well, it's clear that they're not in the original painting. So who are they? Well, if you stand in front of the, the painting, there's only two possible uh, conclusions. Either it's the painter who was painting himself, or it's you as the viewer who is standing in front of the mirror looking at the painting. Um, here we see the, the even more detail of those two figures. And so basically what von Eyck was doing there, and it's not a coincidence because of the whole position and, and, and the composition of the painting, what he was basically doing was portraying the artist and portraying the viewer. So he was basically questioning the relationship between the artist, the artwork, but also between the artwork and the viewer. And so indirectly between the painter and the viewer. So um, it's one of the first times that painters start thinking about painting, start thinking about art and what, what it means and what the function um, and the importance of art is. Um, we see this also with uh, Vermeer, for instance. Um, another interesting point is that um, Van Eyck, as well as Vermeer, as many other painters, um, probably used lenses and mirrors to make their paintings. And it's, uh, it's uh, a study that started with, um, was, or was uh, done by David Hockney, a contemporary painter, who um, noticed that at one point in history, like within one decade, painters all of a sudden could paint so much more precise, so much better. So in order to think that like from one generation to another, like artists were so much more skilled and crafted, he started looking for an explanation and found it in the use of the lenses and, and the mirrors. And so what he discovered was basically that artists would project the image of their subject matter projected on the canvas and basically would trace it um, quite often with such precision that like um, uh, the chandelier in the previous painting, for instance, um, was scanned into a computer and they could rotate it. And it turns out that like the whole perspective and uh, perspectivism was perfect. Like um, you could turn that computer image around and there was like absolutely no mistakes. So obviously there must have been some kind of mechanism to get that kind of precision. Um, Vermeer as well was uh, known to um, use lenses and uh, um, mathematicians were even able to uh, calculate what type of lenses that he used based on um, the perspectivism that is in his paintings. So, um, but again, like it's not only using the glass, but it's also like, how are you going to portray it? And again, like Vermeer here clearly makes um, a statement about art. The, the title of the painting is The Skill That Comes, which is like old uh, Dutch and means the art of painting. So he basically, he literally paints about the art of painting. Um, another example of Quentin Matzaz, uh, the moneylender. Again, like, um, we see this, this couple that is like lending money to, to people, but again, in the front, like very prominent in the, in the picture, we see that mirror that opens up the plane where all of a sudden we can see the window and we can see outside. Um, 
of course, mirrors are also very important for self portraits. And again, like um, we see self portraits um, as one way of bringing the artist in the artwork and, and basically talking about that relationship between the two. In this case, we see um, a self portrait again, like in a um, um, not in a flat mirror, but in a domed mirror. And so again, we see that distortion. And of course, like he would put his face in the center of uh, the mirror where there's little uh, distortion and the rest kind of like crowns around it, uh, if you want. This is an example of uh, a vanitas. Um, a vanitas is a type of paintings that were very popular at the time. And it, de it depicts elements that um, have to deal with time and with changes over time. So we see quite often clocks like we see here uh, in front. Um, quite often uh, we see also skulls here, musical instruments, which are basically um, not lasting when you play music. Quite often they also have flowers that pass their, um, their, their glory days. Um, so all things that relate to the passing of time and to the temporarity of, of life. And um, in this case, like we see this, this uh, sphere here, where again, we see the reflection of the artist making the actual painting. And so not only is he talking about the mortality of everything, but he's also um, literally showing his own mortality in this way. Um, it becomes even more complex in this example of uh, Johannes Gump, where he makes a self portrait. But so we see the artist from the back who is looking in the mirror, who is painting himself. And all that by itself is a painting. So basically, we have a copy of a copy of a copy, which is a copy of the actual reality as well. So it, it, it uh, clearly shows all those different layers of what is an image and what is reality and how um, does a, a painting relate to reality and, and to the reality of the artist. Another well-known example is uh, Las Meninas from Velázquez. Um, here we see the painter literally painting himself from the position of the two people that are being portrayed. So we see Velázquez here like painting the big canvas of the king and the queen who are standing in the place where we as a viewer are literally standing. And again, like we see this like um, thing happening here with this, this image where it's uh, kind of like dubious in a way that like it could be a painting because the walls are plastered with paintings. But then again, because of the light, it doesn't feel the same or look the same as the other paintings. So there must be something else happening. So it could be just another like opening, like the opening of the door. And so we could like be looking into another space or more likely it's a mirror. And what we see is basically the king and the queen who are being portrayed. And so who are standing again, like in the position where we as a viewer are standing. So again, questioning that whole relationship between um, artwork, artist, viewer, people that are being portrayed, and, and what is reality and what is uh, the reality of the image. Another example here where again, like we see the artist um, actually painting the painting, uh, but also more recently we see that uh, uh, happening in, uh, uh, for example, here, um, a bar at the Folie Bergère by Manet, where again, like, um, oh, sorry, where again, we see uh, the lady here behind the bar. Um, the audience is not the audience that we see directly, but it's a big mirror behind the bar. So the audience is sitting on, on this side of the painting. Again, we see the back of the, um, the woman in front of the bar. And then in the corner here, we see a man standing in front of the bar. And so you can tell that the lady is looking straight into the eyes of the customer. And so when we look at the eyes here, she's looking straight at us as well. So again, like, are we part of the painting? Uh, is that painting part of our reality or not? Um, Escher, again, like another example, um, self-portrait again, 
in this like uh, mirrored sphere. We see the hand being depicted directly. We see the rest of the body being depicted in, in, in the reflection and the distortion of the sphere. We see the whole interior, yet the background is completely empty. So again, like very like intentionally questioning like that whole differences between like, well, what is reality? What is not? What do we see? What don't we see? And uh, definitely uh, questioning all that. And making it at the same time very clear that like everything is an illusion to begin with. We're looking at the image. We're not looking at reality at all. Um, in this uh, example of Matisse, um, we don't see any um, specific use of, of uh, mirror or, or um, any kind of like relationship between painting and viewer other than maybe the distortion of the fishbowl. Um, but the reason why I bring this picture in is because we know that Matisse was using what they call a black mirror or a cloud mirror. Um, and uh, basically what that is was a trick that um, since the 17th century was used by quite a few uh, painters where they basically had like a little pocket mirror and it was made of um, black glass and black glass reflects the light just as powerful as a silvered mirror. Um, so you can, you can totally see like the whole reflection and all its details. The big difference with uh, a black mirror and a, and a silvered mirror is that the black mirror tones down all the contrasts. And so that's why painters would use it when they would paint a landscape or in this case, like a, um, a portrait or a still life. What they would do is like by the time the painting was finished, they would basically turn it 190 degrees and then they would take the mirror and kind of like hold it next to them so they could see in the mirror, um, they could look at what they just painted and compare it with the actual painting that they just made. And so they could basically check the image to see whether certain details got lost because of like the big um, um, intensities of light that, that we see in real life. And so it was this little trick to like, kind of like make the final um, 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 refinement to the, to the painting. So um, what does all this mean for stained glass? Because we've been talking now for a bit about, about painting. So, but what happens with uh, stained glass? Well, we see that there is a revival um, starting in the early 19th century, but mainly around like the, the turn of the 20th century. Um, in the early 19th century, um, stained glass was in a situation where pretty much the whole um, industry was decimated. Like there were like um, very few stained glass um, studios open. In Bruges, for instance, uh, at the heydays of stained glass, there were 300 studios. Um, now there were like barely a handful left. Um, same thing happened in France, same thing happened in, in England. And a lot of the knowledge and a lot of the craftsmanship and the skills got lost. And so when um, um, King Louis, uh, Louis Philippe in, in France, um, wanted to build a chapel in Dreux, um, he wanted to commission stained glass windows because like it was a time where um, 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 neo-Gothic style was very popular again. And, and so King Louis Philippe was a, an admirer of the neo-Gothic. And of course, like when you talk about Gothic, you talk about stained glass windows. And so in the chapel, he wanted to have stained glass windows. And again, like he approached like, like the top artists of that time, people like Angre and, and uh, Delacroix. And um, he commissioned them to make uh, stained glass or design stained glass windows. Um, they were executed by um, uh, Violette Le Duc. Um, so in this case here, we see that the figures were based on paintings from Angre. The background was done by uh, Violette Le Duc. So uh, a very similar approach as what we saw in the Renaissance. Um, but in order to be able to make these uh, stained glass windows, they basically had to um, rebuild a whole new studio um, or, or um, um, they commissioned basically um, um, the studio in Sèvres um, 
were, were, that was known for like porcelain and ceramics to build a glass and to reestablish glass. And it took uh, Brongar, who was leading um, this project, it took him on about 20 years in order to like figure out all the formulas and, and uh, all the, the um, again, like the knowledge around painting and staining the glass. Um, in the UK, we see a revival of stained glass under the influence of uh, John Ruskin and William Morris with his arts and crafts movement, um, where all the crafts were basically revived and, and as a reaction against like industrial processes and stained glass windows was also one of them. In North America, we see that um, Louis Comfort Tiffany becomes very popular um, and he as well like made um, not only like lampshades and blown glass, but he also made quite a few stained glass windows um, that quite often were influenced uh, clearly, as you can see here, by the Art Nouveau. So although all these new things are happening, you could argue that like within painting, it's maybe still a little bit more avant-garde, a little bit more like, um, like at the forefront. Uh, when we look at, for instance, this example of Gustav Klimt, also part of the Art Nouveau. But then after Art Nouveau, when the Art Deco uh, comes, uh, we see that more and more glass gets back integrated in a way that like it used to be in the heydays of the Renaissance. And so Frank Lloyd Wright, for instance, used quite a bit of uh, stained glass windows to integrate it in, the, in his building. Not so much as a, an afterthought or an addition to it afterwards, but like really as part of the whole design uh, uh, of, of the building, like really incorporated within the architecture. But also artists like Joseph Alberts, who was like uh, very intrigued by, by color and, and did a lot of like color studies on, on paper, was also interested in color studies in, in, in glass, for instance, like, and he was an important figure in, in the Bauhaus. Um, Probably the most important movement of the 20th century is uh, Cubism, one of the main, um, or one of the two main um, um, Cubists, aside from Picasso, is George Braque. And we see that also George Braque made some stained glass windows later on. Um, I would argue that if you look at this stained glass window, it, it certainly doesn't have the impact or the influence of, of Cubism. So it's not always like successful when artists uh, go back to stained glass. But then on the other hand, there's artists who like really do it flawlessly, like Fernand Leger, for instance, um, who made this kind of work, also made like big or designed big stained glass windows. Again, the execution was done by somebody else. So we still see that distinction that happened in the Renaissance between on one hand, the designers, the painters, and on the other hand, the glass makers who were basically responsible just for the execution of the glass. That uh, is different with uh, Marc Chagall, for instance. Uh, Chagall, who was again in the first place a painter, also made stained glass windows. And his uh, most important one is probably this one, uh, the America windows, which is permanently installed in the Art Institute in Chicago. But like, um, instead of working with people who would execute a design, he actually made his own paintings. Like he didn't put the glass and lead and all that together, excuse me, or he didn't make his own glass sheets, of course, but he did the actual painting. Um, and so he was not only the designer, but also the executioner of the, um, of the, the, the actual painting. Matisse, who we uh, already just uh, mentioned, um, he again was like in first place a painter, but towards the end of his life, he designed this uh, chapel in Saint Paul de Vence, the south of, of France. And so um, um, this is what they call a Gesamtkunstwerk. So Matisse designed the whole thing, um, like the paint, he did the paintings, the tiles, um, designed the furniture, um, the stained glass windows, everything in the church is from his hand. Now, it was towards the end of his life, and by then Matisse was um, stuck to a wheelchair. And so he wasn't really able to paint anymore the way he did before. And so um, he started using a lot of uh, cutouts, as you can see here. 
So a lot of his, his um, uh, work during that time was basically collages, uh, as you see in the top right corner. And then he would use that design also like to, to make um, uh, ceramic tiles, like where he would make like whole wall compositions um, um, in ceramic. But he also used it in the chapel here um, for the stained glass windows. And so what we see here is basically how uh, Matisse extended his paintings into the stained glass windows. And of course, like if, if you analyze the work that he was making, this is the almost the logical next step. Um, there's no way that you could get like the same intensity and the same contrast and the same power of color um, um, in, a, in a print or in a painting or in a, in a collage as you can get with stained glass windows. So it's no surprise that Henri Matisse considered this project, this work as being his most important in his life, not just because of the size, but also um, without a doubt because of like that intensity in, in color that he was able to achieve. So again, like we see how here glass is not being used because of its intrinsic qualities, but it's being used because of its like power of color and, and working with light, um, but it's still basically built upon the art of painting. And we see that happening um, in other projects later on as well. Um, this is an example of um, um, a cathedral in, in Brasilia, in, in the capital of Brazil. Um, and so we see that like with the revival of, of stained glass, um, like it, it is back like it was in the heydays. Like we see it back happening in like big projects. We see it happening in like uh, integrating it in totally new ways. Like here, for instance, uh, the Thanksgiving Chapel in Dallas, um, where we see the building here and the stained glass is literally like on top of it, um, um, which is quite um, innovative. Uh, and we also see that like um, light is becoming again like this very important element within within architecture. Um, the Gaudi uh, uh, Basilica of La Sagrada Familia in, in Barcelona is uh, very well known, is still under construction. Um, but so we see how again stained glass really takes this important place and how it like really like um, basically um, like covers the whole building in color, you know, like talking about like, um, like sacral light, like it doesn't get more sacral than, than this, I, I guess. Um, now, the big change that happened in the Renaissance, I would say also happens again in the 20th century. Um, like I said, like with the previous examples, we see how it was basically an extension of, of painting. But with Duchamp and Richter, you will see that like they're aiming for something else. They no longer try to approach glass from uh, the perspective of a painter, but they're trying to approach glass for its intrinsic qualities and trying to use that. So. Um, this work from, from Duchamp, uh, Fountain, is what, what he called a ready-made. And so it was Duchamp's intention to take the influence of the artist and the maker out of the picture so that it's all about the artwork. Um, so he basically wanted to um, um, make an artwork that was non-retinal. Um, in other words, for him, it was not about like how the artwork looked like. It was like, how can it change our perception? And so it was more um, um, an intellectual process than a, a visual process for him. And so ultimately his goal was the dematerialization um, of the paint and making the art, uh, artist invisible. And so hence the ready-mates were of course like a, a logical um, uh, conclusion. Um, but so what he wanted to do was basically surpass the retinal painting, as he called it, like so things that had to be seen by, by um, the eyes. It's a little bit ironic that uh, he actually has to use um, um, 
painting to get to that point. It's kind of uh, a paradox, but um, um, I guess like glass for him was in that sense important. Um, but it was not so much like looking for like visual transparency, but more for like absolute transparency. Um, like, like I said, it was not a matter of like seeing the artwork. It was a matter of like intellectually understanding the artwork. And so where futurism was trying to capture a movement and cubism was uh, creating a pictorial space, Duchamp was trying to create a hypothetical um, intellectual space in which a, a conceptual transition takes place. And so that led to the creation of the large glass, um, which in my opinion is the first uh, work in glass that um, works with the, in, or deals with intrinsic qualities of glass, as I like to call it. So it's no longer just depending on um, visual aspects, but it, it's um, creating this intellectual space. And so um, it's we don't have enough time to like go over all the details of these paintings because like there or, or this work because like there's been books written about it. Um, but in short, what we see here is um, um, a depiction of the relationship between a male and a female. And so in the bottom, we see the male part. In the top, we see the female part. Um, through all kind of like um, weird processes, there is this like gas that is being produced by the male uh, metallic molds here that you see in the corner. It gets um, via the chocolate grinder, it goes into this process where it shoots up to the female and then the female responds and um, sends out like noises and, and uh, um, um, uh, all kind of like uh, juices. And so like, again, like a lot of it is not visible even uh, on the screen, like there's invisible elements as well. But Duchamp has a whole description about how, how this piece functions. Um, it's uh, two frames of glass. Um, you can see right through it. So um, I forgot to put in uh, a more clear picture. Um, you can see right through it. So it's basically the imagery is made by uh, in part um, copper sheets, but also like dust that he used from the studio, silvering of a mirror, parts are painted um, and it's sandwiched between two glasses. After the first exhibition, um, because he always considered the, the work to be unfinished, but after the first exhibition, it broke. And that's why we see all those cracks here. But so after um, it came back, he like perfectly restored the whole work, sandwiched it between two glass pieces so that again, he could exhibit it. And as by coincidence, the, the cracks kind of like follow this kind of like process that he had in mind and that he was trying to depict. So um, for him, like he didn't see it as um, a destruction, he saw it as like an addition uh, to the painting and like declared that now the painting was finished. But in reality, the painting is never, or the work is never finished. Like it only gets um, its final conclusion in the mind of the viewer. And so that's that intellectual process that he's talking about. Now, he probably used glass so that his whole mechanism, his whole machine would be floating in, in space and would not be grounded on, on a canvas or on the background or whatever. Um, so that's a good reason to use glass. But the other reason is because um, Duchamp was very aware about the fact that when light enters glass, it slows down. The glass actually slows down the light. And that's why you get like um, diffraction. That's why you get distortion when you look through glass. And so um, Duchamp was very aware of it. And one of the indications is that the working title for this piece, which took him from 1915 to 23, so eight years, um, the working title that he wa had was Retard en Verre, which is French and means delay in glass. And so again, like clearly indicating that the glass gets delayed in the glass. And um, again, that was like part of the whole intellectual space that he was trying to create. So that's why I say like for the first time, um, Duchamp was using glass for another reason than just the visual. Um, Gerard Richter, just like Duchamp, um, was also exploring new perceptions of glass as a medium. Um, 
but it's important to realize that he's in the first place painter and totally committed to the art of painting. Um, like here we see, for instance, uh, Gerhard Richter's um, Confrontation One, which is a depiction of uh, one of the um, terrorists of the baden meinhof Group, uh, um, in, uh, which was active in Germany in the 70s. And so 10 years later, he made this painting based on images that appeared in uh, a magazine 10 years earlier. Um, on the right, we see um, uh, an image of his uh, uncle Rudy, who was an SS officer in, in, in um, the Second World War and died uh, early on in the war. Um, again, like based off of an image that he found. And so uh, he clearly diffuses the images, um, not only to blur it out, but also to kind of like um, make, make the whole like subject matter a little bit more uh, blurry, if you want. Um, and so what, what he was doing, because like Richter made like a lot of like um, um, different styles of painting, like he, he kind of like did it all and, and tried every single possible technique. Um, and so what he was doing, he was basically systematically exploring um, um, the boundaries and, and, and trying to tackle various styles of painting and compare them, reposition them. Um, he also investigates the position of painting in regard with other uh, media, like for instance, photography. And so um, um, in his whole like over and, and during his whole career for Richter, it's all about the image, the image itself um, that always stays central in his work. And um, um, in that sense, he also uses uh, um, glass, but even when he uses glass, um, in part or uh, completely glass, it's still about the image and, and the picture that he creates. Um, we see that um, immediately when we look at this first um, piece that he made in glass, um, it's uh, called Four Glass from 1967. So there's four panes of industrial glass in metal frames, which can be tilted horizontally. Um, so although at first sight, this has nothing to do with painting, uh, it clearly refers to painting in the sense that it refers to the painting as the window on the world, right? Like remember perspectivism as like you open up a new world, you look through a window. And so this is a clear reference to that. Um, but it's also uh, linked to the bride stripped bare by her bachelor's even, which we just saw and fresh widow, which are both works of, of Marcel Duchamp. Um, but what is different in comparison uh, with the previous glass pieces of other artists that we saw uh, is that um, he uses the transparency and the reflection of the glass to help create the whole pictorial image. So in, in Schwarzschild gold, for instance, um, he connects the symbol of the German flag um, with the federal parliament building in which it, uh, in which it hangs. So this was a commission when um, the, the um, unification of Germany happened and when uh, Berlin got the new Reichstag and, and, and um, the Bundestag in, in the capital. So this was one of the commissions of artworks in there. And so by using the reflection of the glass, because he could have painted it, of course, but by using glass, he reflected the building where um, the people uh, that were elected by the German uh, people um, um, were working. And so, um, the reflection not only includes the building, but it also includes the people themselves that are walking there. So indicating that the, the, the symbol um, has no meaning without both these elements like the government and the people. Um, so he uses basically, um, what, what he does is, is like, he no longer paints the glass like previous artists did, but he, he used glass directly as a medium um, for painting, like I would argue. Um, and he doesn't limit himself to simply representing the visual perception to stimulate certain visual experiences um, within the viewer, but instead he uses the glass itself to give the viewer a direct experience instead of, of via a detour. Um, his whole enterprise is intended to undermine the belief that we have direct access to the truth. 
Um, the images we see can have meaning or not, but show us this, at the same time that we don't understand reality. Um, through his use of the medium, Richter creates monochrome work that questions the whole of visual and spiritual perception. And in doing so, he radically re rejects the sacred, the idealistic or utopian character of, of the glass itself. Um, so in other words, Richter does not idealize visual perception and doesn't leave any space for any, any um, metaphysical experiences. Um, on the contrary, he basically leaves the viewer um, with, with only his or her own visual experience and the presence of his own or his, her own reflection. You see that very clearly here in the seven standing panes where the different layers of the glass um, give different reflections of the person looking at it. Uh, it's also very clear in um, this work called Eight Gray um, by using um, um, a neutral color and almost like in dust or, or almost like clinical looking industrial glass um, that, that provokes absolutely no emotion. Um, um, it leaves the viewer only with like um, drawing attention to the, or, or it only draws attention to the discrepancy between what one see firsthand and what one, uh, and what happens when, when that image is being recreated uh, pictorially. Um, so, and, and I quote Richter here, what he says is, I don't mistrust reality of which I know next to nothing. I mistrust the picture of reality to, uh, uh, conveyed to us by our senses, which is imperfect and cir circumscribed. Our eyes have evolved for survival purposes. The fact that we can also see the stars is pure accident. So in other words, like, it's all about the image. Um, he also did this like huge stained glass window um, in the cathedral in Köln, but I see I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster now. Um, so that brings us to today and some contemporary um, um, examples of, of uh, stained glass. And so what we see more and more is how the artists uh, also uh, become the makers again. Um, Joseph Cavallari here made this series of The Simpsons, but so he doesn't only design, he also makes and executes the work. Same with Judith Schachter. Um, and especially in her work is that she also often uses like many different layers of glass so that she really gets um, depth into her work more than in just like the one layer um, um, stained glass window. Um, obviously like Today's contemporary artists also use contemporary subject matters um, very clearly here um, in, in these works. Um, it also goes 3D, like uh, this is a design of uh, a driverless sleeper car. Um, so the idea is that the car would be driving itself and that you could take a nap under like this, like beautiful stained glass um, dome. Uh, Wind Delvoix. Uh, made a lot of stained glass windows. Um, but in this case, he's not interested in exploring the intrinsic values of the medium, or he's not uh, um, interested in um, um, like the expression of, of the stained glass itself as, as a form of painting. Um, but he's basically more making a comment about um, the stained glass tradition. And using it here, like he uses x-rays to make a stained glass. Um, again, like referring to the, the, the Gothic cathedral, um, as you can see here. Um, but by using x-rays, he basically um, sees through the body and, um, and, and, and depicts an analogy between looking through the body to death and looking through the stained glass to the heavens kind of thing. Um, Symphonic sculpture. This is like a large tower, which is all about stained glass uh, in the interior. Um, another example of like glass constructions. Although I must say this particular uh, example is not um, traditional glass, but it's plexiglass. Um, Olafur Eliasson, who um, made this like huge work at the Kunstmuseum Aarhus in, in Denmark. 
um it's basically an experience of of color if you want like uh, your whole experience is about like walking through this tunnel of colored light um kiki smith um, and deborah gans who made this piece um in the synagogue in new york but also like complete um, buildings are being cladded with um, um form of stained glass so here we see um, uh, an example of uh, um, designed by Jaab Drupstein um, it's it's the building um, in in Holland where they collect all the the sound and images um, like from TV and 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 all that um, from from um, Dutch broadcasters um, and so it's depicted on the outside of the building. So basically what he did was images from like movies and TV programs that he would um, distort so that it wouldn't be like too banal or too obvious um, and then uh, put it on the outside of the building. So basically what you see on the outside of the building is what is being stored inside of the building. Um, it's also like a very complex uh, a building with a, with a big basement and all that, like very interesting to, to look into if you want. And then I want to end with uh, some examples of Sarah Hall. Uh, she's Canadian. And uh, here we see uh, a work um, called Lux Gloria. It's uh, a big cathedral. And what is different in her work is that she incorporates uh, solar panels in the building. So not only like uh, does it decorate the building and has it like uh, um, an artistic value, but it also has a very practical value in the sense that it um, um, is a building that makes energy um, in part it can be used to light the glass at night but also like it can um, 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 provide uh, um, energy for the environment another project that she did was in in toronto in harborfront center uh, where she um, uh, did the power plant and in her work like not only does she use solar panels but she also used like a, a whole like combination of different techniques like um, staining printing painting fusing silvering like you name it um, so again like very clearly the hand of the maker um, not just designing the window but being actual part of the making process uh, and so we see here that example which is like um, all four facades um, she has ideas, she's retired now officially, um, but she has ideas uh, that kind of related to solar panels um, in, in combination for designs for skyscrapers, um, not just to produce energy, but also to avoid um, bird kills that are happening all the time now in, in today's um, glass cities. So this is where I want to end. So this is where stained glass is nowadays and uh, where it came from. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Sorry, I went a little bit over time. But... Thank you so much, Kuhn, for this very interesting lecture on the intrinsic qualities of glass. Um, I have a question. Uh, what are your views and thoughts on the works done by the Studio Glass Movement? all the very uh, skilled glass floors versus a contemporary artist. Where do they fit? Um, the studio glass movement um, is not just related to um, stained glass, obviously, but also like to, to all aspects of glass, including glass blowing and all that. Uh -huh. um, it's a very important movement in the sense that it brought a lot of innovation. Um, it brought a lot of like knowledge and skill within the arts community. So it helped in, in um, closing that gap between craft and art. Um, although it's it's a very peculiar um, history, I would say, like it started in, in the 60s. Um, and Originally, it was a very eclectic movement, like it incorporated not only artists, but also collectors and um, 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 engineers, technologists, um, people that were not interested in art, but more interested in like making and production. So it had all levels uh, of, of um, artistic and technical uh, qualities. Um, and so as a movement, I think it's, its major thing was that it, it um, 
like I said, like it, it brought knowledge and skill to the artists as an artistic movement. I don't think there was an artistic movement involved. Um, and, and, and that's probably the reason what we see now happening is that like more and more um, the glass communities is starting to split up in people that are like um, involved in contemporary arts and people that are involved in production glass and people that are involved in, in um, developing glass or developing equipment. Um, and, and I have the impression that it's becoming less and less homogeneous also because it's, it's becoming bigger and bigger. And so I think that in the next decades, it's gonna kind of like split up uh, in a way that different glass people will have different interests and, and get closer to um, those interests outside of the glass world. Anybody has any other questions? I'm looking at uh, the questions in the chat. Yeah. I see here, great talk from early in your talk. Why was glass forbidden for making chalices? Um, to be honest, um, the real reason I don't know either. I don't even know if anybody really knows why. Um, but I could imagine that um, um, glass was, con was not considered to be a noble material. Um, we know that during the Egyptian period, glass was considered to be um, in the same realm as the semi-precious metals, uh, sorry, semi-precious stones and the, and the precious metals like gold and silver. But with the uh, Romans, that, that whole idea shifted. And so we know from the Roman time period that um, glass was no longer considered to be a noble material. On the contrary, it, was, it became a very ordinary material. And a lot of like noblemen in, in, in Roman society um, loved like the practicality of glass and loved the fact that it wouldn't give any taste or anything, but didn't want to use like glass drinking vessels because it was so ordinary. Like even the soldiers would, would have like glass cups in their in their backpacks instead of like ceramic cups sometimes. So um, so I can imagine that like based on on on, on that knowledge that during the medieval times um, there was like a similar idea that glass just wasn't like um, a noble enough material to make something noble as a chalice for instance that that needed to be done in, in silver or in gold i assume that that's the reason why i think here there's another person asking question beginning no Uh, Kuhn, I, I, I'd like to ask you, what is something you can do with glass that you can't do with other mediums? Um, oh, there's a lot, but um, sorry to interrupt, but like I see here in the comments that somebody yeah. else is basically ask, um, Go um, ahead. answering the question. So um, George Arbit writes that beginning in the early ninth uh, century, Glass was expressly named among the forbidden materials for this purpose because it is fragile. So there was a risk of spilling the blood of Christ if a chalice were to break. Um, so thank you for that information. I was not aware of that. So thank you. Um, so to come back to your question, like what can you do with glass that you cannot do with uh, other materials? Um, obviously there is the transparency, although you could argue that some other materials are transparent or semi-transparent as well. Um, but, uh, but I, for me, like personally, I think it's, it's um, the fact that you can, I see glass as the ideal medium as the interface between reality and virtuality um, in, in very practical ways, like the way we are com communicating now, it's all through glass, right? Like uh, we're looking at the glass lens in our camera and you're seeing me on a glass screen. And um, some of the information is probably going even through glass fiber cables. Um, so, so there's that very practical um, interface. 
oh. but I also uh, think that it's like um, um, like the ideal material to talk about like the difference between reality and virtuality, if there is a difference to begin with. That's great. What about, I, I wanted to ask you also about the authorship of an artwork. Do you think the glass floors should share the authorship of an artwork along with the artist who taught, who thought and designed the work to be made? It's, it's a different, uh, a difficult question in the sense that like, um, I believe that the authorship is still with the artist who designed the work. Um, and I guess it's a question that is mainly asked within the glass community, but is not really questioned in, in other medias. For instance, I don't know any bronze uh, or, or, or sculptors who make bronzes, who cast their own bronze and nobody's questioning it. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I don't, uh, I, I think that the full authorship remains with the artist. On the other hand, and you see that in bronze as well, like quite often it carries the stamp of the um, bronze casting facility where it was made um, as kind of like a stamp of quality um, and I guess a respect for the makers as well and I think that's a very um, um, polite and very cautious way of dealing with with uh, that problem that indeed like um, um, artists can acknowledge that it was not made by them but made by others um, and and like it could carry that stamp as not only respect for the makers but also um, a proof of quality in many ways but again like we're living in, in a in a society and in a, in, in, a, in a practice where um, more and more we depend on each other and we depend on others uh, to to execute um, work, not just within the arts, but just in general, like the technology is evolving so quickly. And there's so many options nowadays that you cannot be the master of all you cannot like be able to do it all yourself. So, so it's normal that people have that like subcontracting happening. And, and this is just another one of those examples. Thank you. Kun. Anyone else has any other questions? I, I, uh, I, I have a question, yes, yeah, sure. So uh, Kun, as I was following some of the examples from, uh, I'd say uh, 16th century, I noticed that whenever uh, glass was introduced, whether as a mirror or as a, any surface for reflection, uh, more often than not, the source of light was uh, rendered visible. So the source of light that was illuminating the painting itself was rendered visible. Uh, was this intentional? Was this a practice? Was this a device by which to introduce light in a place where you had a dark uh, spot? And then I noticed that also in Escher's uh, uh, drawing that in that same sphere, he seems to be also making a reference to these early examples by showing the window panes, uh, which are illuminating his drawing. Um, there is definitely a direct relationship between the two. Um, so it's one of the, the things that uh, David Hockney um, talks about in his study. It was one of the clues that he got to um, indicate um, his theory like when he was studying those um, new type of paintings that were so much more perfect, um, he, was, he was looking at, at what was going on. And one of the things that he noticed was that the pupils of the people being depicted were very small, which indicates that um, there was a lot of light. And you also see that in the paintings themselves that there's high contrasts quite often. Uh, again, indicating that there's a very strong light coming in. And so, um, um, like once he, he found this conclusion of his theories where he said that there was a projection, projection happening um, onto the canvas, it becomes clear why that is. In order to have enough light um, coming into your camera obscura, your, your dark room uh, where, where, you're, where you're actually reflecting the painting, uh, you need a lot of light in order to do that, in order to make that picture visible. 
So, so yes, it's clear that there was a direct reason why there was a lot of light. And so it's not a surprise that that got depicted as well. Uh, I was also interested in the observation you made about the transition to the conceptual in the painting. And I thought that uh, the whole notion of mirroring must have been extremely intriguing for any painters. And that would somehow explain the extent to which they enjoyed introducing mirrors within their painting, because it allowed a multiplication of reality that would have been very difficult to achieve otherwise. Yes, absolutely. Was this also an indication of the perfection or an improvement in the execution of mirrors themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and like, um, it's also something that like a lot of people don't really know, but like, um, a lot of painters during the Renaissance, but also a lot of philosophers were at the same time lens makers. Uh, people like Spinoza um, and, and uh, um, uh, obviously von Leeuwenhoek and, and others, like especially in, 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 in uh, Holland, in, in, in Dutch society at the time, um, <clears throat> were, a lot of them were lens makers. And there was a lot of um, uh, interaction between uh, philosophers and painters as well. And so, um, um, again, like it's, it's not a surprise that the two things kind of like developed hand in hand and um, that painters would not only think about the practicality, but also would think about the consequences and what that means for an image and, and how that image relates to reality. So it all, it all makes sense if you look at the bigger picture. And so, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that like all those depictions that I showed you about like lenses and relationships between artists and, and artwork, um, that those things were not a coincidence. And I'm sure that there were a whole number of artists as well who were just like enjoying the fact that you could make that kind of paintings and enjoying the fact that it would create this like very realistic images. Um, but um, there was definitely a certain percentage and, 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 and I would say the good ones definitely went beyond to just like the depiction and, and like reflected upon the depiction and, and the relationship with reality. If I may, uh, Maria, one last question. No. Unless there are others Other waiting people? to ask. Anybody else? That's it for me. So I'll ask one last question then, uh, Kun, uh, and that roots, my question is rooted in practices in our part of the world, which basically has to do with mosaics. And then we move to constructing, uh, uh, you know, elaborate scenes out of pieces of stained glass, painted, etc. And then we move to Rich Richter's, uh, uh, Cathedral was it, which has an air of pixelization to it. Yep. And then we're we're looking at screens where pixelization is the way our reality is uh, captured, transmitted, and reconstructed. What does this all mean to you? Um, well, in a way, it, it it again means that like um, with the digitalization, glass becomes more and more important. Um, it's, it's another aspect of, of what I could talk about, um, and, and I talk about it a bit more in, in, in my book, I guess. Um, and, and maybe if you're planning like a similar series next year, I can have a lecture about that. But again, like I see the glass as the interface between um, the, the real world and the virtual world. And it has to do, of course, with the whole development of, of new technologies. Um, and, and, and computer technologies and pixelization is, is one element of that. Um, so, yeah, again, like it, it, it's hard for me to like put it in, in like one sentence or, or like being like really concise about it. Um, but, but there's more happening as well. Like, in my book, I describe how it is through the new technology and through 
the pixelization and and like the the, the possibility of making depictions on a computer screen based on like mathematical uh, calculations or just like um, drawn directly onto a, a computer program, you're able to do things that you cannot do in reality. And you're able to visualize very, very, very complex structures. Now glass by itself is a very, very, very complex structure as we all know. And like um, the fact that we haven't even been able to find a precise definition is a very good indication of that. But so because of the fact that we are able to understand more complex structures due to digital technology, it also means that we can get a different understanding of glass as a medium and the complexity of glass as a medium. And so one feeds into the other. Um, glass helps develop the whole um, digital technology. Um, again, like without glass, there wouldn't have been a digital technology most likely because we wouldn't be able to visualize it. Um, but so thanks to that, we also get a different understanding of, of glass and, and the possibilities of glass and what we can do with glass. And so I think it's, it's um, something that feeds itself and where that's gonna lead to, I don't know, but I think we're just at the beginning of that. And um, I'm very curious to see what it's gonna, where it's gonna lead us to. But I think that we're just like at the beginning of understanding glass and as a result, also at the beginning of understanding the practical possibilities of glass, not only in, in uh, technology and, and science, but also within the arts. Very nice end to a beautiful lecture. Thank you, Cohen. Thank welcome. you very much. It was totally my pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Maria, for moderating for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jihad. Thank you for having us.